Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Library podcast. I'm Damon Tamanawala. You know my co-host, Garrett McGilvery. And today joining us from MNP is a partner of Forensic and Legal. Uh, I butchered it. Well, can you can you introduce yourself, Greg? <laughs> yeah, hey, Damon. It's uh, Greg Draper. I'm a partner with MNP's uh, Forensics and Litigation Support Practice based in Calgary. Very nice. Very nice. Um, okay, and and for those who might not know what that is, can you elaborate on what you do in your position? Yeah, I, I specialize in financial crime investigation and risk management, right? So generally what I like to say is I help organizations with the financial, legal, and reputational risks that are posed by really by bad behavior of, of certain people. Um, okay. Some of that you know, here, I work with businesses who are subject to FinTrack requirements and uh, need to support their efforts and obligations when it comes to detecting and deterring uh, money laundering and terrorist financing. And for those of the, our listeners that are unaware, what what is money laundering? <laughs> so, money laundering yes. it's 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 a it's a euphemism, but a common one, right? And it's really about taking dirty money, right? That the proceeds of profit motivated crimes like drug trafficking, human trafficking, fraud, uh, illegal gambling, political corruption, all of that and making it appear clean, right? So dirty money to clean, right? So criminals criminals do all this, not just for the thrill, they do it to enjoy the profits of their illegal business, right? They need to make it look like it comes from a clean source uh, so they don't attract too much attention from law enforcement or CRA or, you know, or their neighbors. Um, and also they, so they wanna take a dirty dirty money and make it look clean so they can use it. The, the terrorist financing piece that's attached to it and is often kind of just lumped in with money laundering um, it's often about making the destination look clean. Uh, the money itself may be legitimate to begin with, but it's being used for an illegal purpose. And so there's, there is some concealment of all that, right? Overall, right, the bad guys want to conceal the source and beneficial ownership of the funds until they can, uh, till they can use it in an appropriate way. Greg, sir, this is, I'm so interested in this. What, can you describe the I've heard there are three steps to money laundering, the the layering, the, you know, can you describe the intricacies of that process? Yeah, absolutely, right? And this this is important because, you know, money laundering uh, it takes a whole bunch of different ways. The criminals are always coming up with new ways to do it. Uh, and legitimate businesses may uh, just have single touch points of a multi-step process, right? So it's helpful to think of those three basic stages of uh, of money laundering, placement, layering, and integration, right? So placement is the actual cash and it's getting it into the financial system. And, and important to remember that nowadays, um, it's a global financial system, right? The cash can come in anywhere and, and uh, you know, it's made more complicated by informal banking systems uh, that, uh, that have been used for thousands of years around the world in different cultures besides sort of our, our you know, our North American view of, of the financial system. Uh, virtual currency is making that even more uh, more difficult. So, you know, some of the kind of main things on the placement side, casinos are a big thing, right? There's a lot of news right now, particularly out of British Columbia, individuals walking up to the, you know, the casino window with a hockey bag full of blood-soaked $20 bills and, and buying <laughs> chips to go, to go gaming. Uh, you know, there's the old cash-based business. You know, I own a pizza restaurant and, you know, my reporting my sales and that or nail salons or car washes or whatever it might be. Um, and we'll give some examples maybe on the real estate side and the, on the placement piece of it, right? So you imagine uh, a bad guy buys a, buys a strip mall, right? And uh, takes the cash from his illegal activities. And he may not actually have any tenants in that strip mall, but he puts up signs, makes it look like there's businesses in there. And when he goes to the bank with a bag of cash, he says, yeah, this is the rent from my tenants. So once a month, he's taking cash from his dirty business and putting it into his bank account, reporting it as, as rent from his strip mall that he has, right? Right. Right. Second piece then is layering. And, th and this is how, how does how do you get sort of interrupt, Greg? How do you get the strip mall in the first place? Like, isn't the money flagged when you buy it, when you do that placement? Um, it depends on how you buy it. Right. So you, you can you can drop a bag of cash off at your lawyer and he can put it in his trust fund and then put the you know issue a check from his tr from his trust to purchase the real estate. Um, you can uh, you can get a mortgage for it, right? Make mortgage payments. Yeah, there's there's a whole bunch of different ways that that you can do it, right? So you can use shell companies, you can use nominee straw buyers. 
What's that? What's that mortgage uh, method you you were just mentioning? This is, by the way, Greg. Just so you know, so the title of this might be "How to Launder Money yeah, and Not yeah. Get Caught." So, so, well, so yeah, so I, I'll need ten percent of any of these tricks that you uh, that you put into effect, and you know, if they make it. One hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah, I'll take a hundred percent. Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, so how do so how do you do it with a with a mortgage? You. How, how does that work? You know, we saw a lot, and we'll we'll touch on some of my past experience when I was doing organized crime investigations back in the, uh, you know, fifteen or twenty years ago in Calgary, when real estate prices were hot, the banks were tripping over themselves to give out mortgages because, you know, you you loan, you know, eighty percent to asset value, and you know that it's going to double, or you think it's going to double in the next five years. The bank feels like it's a pretty secure bet. Um, right. And uh, you know they'll, they'll loan to it, and then you know, they'll extend a mortgage with a with a modest down payment, and then individuals are are uh, you know either using laundered money or some form of legitimate income to to at least get that. I mean, there's it wouldn't be the first time that someone lied on them on a mortgage. Now, maybe that's more on the residential side, but it would apply for I think modest commercial real estate purposes as well. Okay. Right, so so I'll jump back to that. Right, we talked about placement a little bit, getting the cash in the system, and and you know, we can we can chat a little bit about how that works out too. The layering side is is, uh, is structuring the transaction. Right, it's the movement of money to conceal its source and its ownership. Uh, it's I think back to you know when you were six years old and you're playing cards and didn't know how to shuffle them properly. You just lay them out on the desk and kind of just swirl mm -hmm. your hands around and right. So that's that's the layering piece of it. Right. So I mean another example, you could have bulk cash. That hockey bag full of money it's deposited in a foreign jurisdiction maybe one that isn't quite as discerning as as canada can be right so think you know the, panama. the, the panama the the caribbean um uh, cyprus um kazakhstan right who knows right you, you've got cash that goes in there uh it's maybe it's wired to a private equity firm in the channel islands uh, right or Switzerland, you know, and put into a you know, some sort of tax haven location there, right? Then that investment is placed in a real estate limited partnership in in Canada, and you've got foreign exchange at each step, right? So mm. every time money moves from a jurisdiction, from a custodian, from you know, from an individual that's holding it, it creates a paper trail that makes it harder for law enforcement in particular to trace it back, right? That's an extremely time consuming and complex process to unwind that. Um, you know, cash is not on the blockchain. You can't just go to a website and figure out where a particular bills come from uh, its entire existence. So, you know, all of those all of those steps is layering just just buries the source and beneficial ownership of uh, of the funds. And then that last piece is integration. Right? This is like I said, this is this is profit motivated crime. The bad guys want to enjoy their hard work. Um, and they want to, you know, they want to have the 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 assets available for their use. So some of that things like you know luxury assets. I mean, and, and the simplest form is 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 of money laundering is taking a bag of cash to a Ferrari dealership and buying a car. Right now, mm -hmm. you no longer have dirty cash with you, but you've got this this quarter million dollar Ferrari that you can enjoy and drive around. And, and maybe people just assume that you know your dad bought it for you. Um, you know, you, you've laundered it in a very simple way. Uh, we'll see it parked in real estate for a while and then flipped uh, or sold as uh, as need be, uh, you know, or it's put into investments and there's a cash flow that that uh, that comes from those investments, right? Whether it's whether it's dividends or or rent payments or uh, you know interest payments, right. you know. And meanwhile, your capital is perceived to be safe in Canada compared to so many jurisdictions around the world. Right, but okay, but again, when you're buying that, when you're doing that initial placement or buying the Ferrari. Nobody at the Ferrari dealership says, "Hey, where'd you get five hundred grand or whatever it is?" <laughs> they're they're not a, they're not obliged to. They're not obliged to. This is one of the perceived loopholes in in Canada's AML compliance regime is that auto dealers are not obliged to. Now, if they, you know, there there is some let me put there's some changes to the criminal law that now says if you're kind of willfully blind to to things potentially being laundering of money. Um, then uh, you could be criminally charged. Uh, right. That that's a it'd be interesting to see if that ever gets proven in court. It's probably more an investigative tool for law enforcement than an actual sort of enforcement tool for the justice system. Uh, but you know, b basically, um, no is the short answer. <laughs> Auto dealers aren't aren't obliged to report to FinTrack like like real estate developers or investment dealers are. So 
um, you know, that's just a simple way you could you could just do it that way. Right. OK, I, I just want to I just want to hammer this home uh, because this is the best. Uh, if you have say you have and I actually know people who fit this description, they bought Bitcoin, I don't know, four or five years ago. And now they just have a few hundred thousand dollars sitting in their bank account and they don't want to pay taxes on that. What is the best strategy to not get caught using real estate? Uh, yeah, I'm about <laughs> I, know, I know this right? is a struggle because I like looking at your LinkedIn, Greg Draper, financial and ethical bodyguard to Canada's best organizations. That is still true. <laughs> that is still true. But we are we are still interested in this the practical application here. Yeah, I mean there so yeah, we're talking hypotheticals and I'm I'm gonna yeah. say that I'm not for the for the benefit of our general counsel, I'm gonna say I'm not giving legal advice or accounting advice to uh you know to, to anyone who may be listening to this we'll uh, podcast site. Right? So yeah, I'll just put that big disclaimer out there we'll for put it up. We'll yeah. put it up on every cliff. Yeah, you know, um, the best way to do it would be likely to have it transferred to, we're seeing more and more law firms accepting cryptocurrency. Um, you could stick it into a numbered company uh, where in most jurisdictions in Canada today, the owners of that company are not obliged to be disclosed or, or, or identified during a real estate transaction, but the director might be, right? So if you were to use that cryptocurrency to um to fund a numbered company in a foreign tax haven where the director of that company is a lawyer and have that company make a a real estate purchase on your behalf you can then own that without really disclosing where the money came from and who was the beneficial owner of that uh, of that company interesting um Garrett, do you you can go ahead so when it comes to, I guess, specifically commercial real estate, um, where is it? Where is the money laundering coming from? Like you talked about, like malicious activities, you know, human trafficking, stuff like that. Is it illegal money that's coming from here, that's made here, or is it coming from like Mexico or Middle East or wherever? Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's both in some respects, right? I mean the the. Um, it is coming all over. It sort of depends on um, on the crime that's generating the proceeds, right? So yeah, there are there are illegal drugs, for example, being sold in Canada that generates cash here that needs to be laundered somehow. There is you know a wide range of of other offenses um, you know here in Canada. But we look at it globally, and because like I said, because we really have a global financial system now with everything from you know swift payments to, to cryptocurrency money can move around the world in the blink of an eye right so you know drug trafficking profits uh you know we're seeing come from asia and south america there may be political corruption from africa there may be the proceeds of cyber attacks and ransomware from russia it can be human trafficking from europe uh, it can be investment fraud and ponzi schemes from north america um, it's really coming from everywhere and, and you know on the the commercial real estate side, what's interesting we're seeing in Canada that's impacting that, and you may have heard of this again, right? Lots of attention in Vancouver in particular to, to casinos and real estate, right? It's even sort of globally amongst money laundering investigators and, and financial intelligence units it's being referred to as the Vancouver model, right? So oh, wow. uh, it's, it's, it's a good case study. Yeah, we've, we've got our own brand, which is, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe maybe not the best thing on a, on a, you know, on a global basis, but right. And, and you know, this is interesting. I mean, it, it started, I think, in part of being driven by currency export restrictions in China in this case, right? So so the Vancouver model works at Chinese residents in China. They take cash that they have they'd like to get out of the country, um, and they'll give it to a local criminal in China. That resident, Chinese resident, then travels to Canada and goes to see that criminal's Canadian associate who gives him back his money, likely less a few points, obviously, in some respects, right? So now he's in Canada with cash that he could not legally remove from China under their regime. Takes that cash, he goes to a casino, drops it in, plays a few hands of, uh, of uh, you know, of, of poker or blackjack or whatever, mm -hmm. um, right? And then cashes those in, and now he's got a disbursement from the casino. So if anyone says, well, where did you get the money from? It's not the cash that the, the you know, the Canadian-based criminal handed to him. It's this casino disbursement, right? 
now what they're seeing is they're putting that into real estate, um, either through shell companies or on their own to generally to hide it from the Chinese tax authorities. So it was, you know, it was driven by a desire to um, get cash from China out of that country, but it helps the criminals because the criminals are involved in, in this case, typically it's, it's, it's fentanyl production and distribution. So the bad guys are producing it in China. They're shipping it to Canada where it's being sold uh, on our streets, causing thousands of deaths a year in this country, frankly. Um, and, you know, they need a way to repatriate their funds back to China to keep that cycle going, right? And, and so by using this resident, um, the drug traffickers are able to get their funds you know, from, you know, the profits that they made by selling fentanyl in Canada. They're able to get that money back in the hands of their producers and suppliers back in, uh, back in China. So it's worked out, worked out well from that stage. But what it's done, too, is, is it pushed up the price of real estate. Um, in an artificial manner. I mean, I think most people working in real estate are not going to complain about prices going up. Mm. But when it's artificially manipulated and, uh, you know, we see issues like, you know, sort of these, these you know, ghost tenants and, you know, forever vacant properties, I think there's there's concerns about the sort of the impact on the communities, the impact on affordability for the next generation of Canadian home buyers uh, and our reputation on the global stage. Right. So just, just for understanding... Um, in terms of the scope, how much money laundering is occurring in Canada present? Yeah, it, it, you know, obviously. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a tricky question, right? Estimates are vague. Um, and there's always a little bit of bias when people are estimating these things that might want to make it sound like a bigger problem, particularly if you get paid by responding to money laundering. Um, and, and these are financial crimes, right? Their existence is meant to be concealed. Um, you know, so if you've detected it, you, you know, maybe they're not doing such a good job. But but the estimates are anywhere from fifty to a hundred billion dollars a year in wow. Canada. That's uh, that's getting moved through, right? Is it is it all uh, you know malicious terrorism, fentanyl production money, or is some of it just you know the innocent person trying to hide their crypto? Yeah, you know, what what percentage would be people just trying to avoid taxes versus? Uh, so, you know these malicious crimes. Well, I mean, you can you can draw a ring around you know in, innocent person trying to hide their crypto, right? So there's tax planning and then there's tax evasion, right? And uh, right. so you know we've got some we've got some great tax accounts in MMP that will happy to tell you the difference right. and walk you walk you through that. But they just uh, did my taxes. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. Well, thank you that. We appreciate that, right? So you know it's not all of it is. I don't know. It's not all. Doctor Evil, like it's not you know this this sort of global conspiracy kind of kind of thing, um, but it is more than that. You know, it it, it is the, the tax evasion piece is a small part of it, I I would think, or at least a less concerning part of it. And mm -hmm. you can argue about you know you can argue about whether um, you know the tax compliance regime is appropriate and you know, whether it's it's driving this behavior and all. But that's that's another that's another uh, podcast and maybe another guest. Um, you know, I, I think it is. I think Canada has developed a reputation. You said you talked about, you, know, you mentioned Panama at the beginning, right? And, and you know, the interesting story back in the day, uh, you know, Pablo Escobar is, you know, the 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 guy who basically introduced the cocaine market to North America was undone because he had hid his money in Panama. And then General mm -hmm. Noriega, the dictator, decided to just to just patriate all the funds that were in there, took all of his cash away. Um, wow. You know, that was it was a bad day for Pablo Escobar and a good day for Manuel Noriega. But I think people think that that's not likely to happen in Canada, right? That their funds are safe, that our banking system is stable, um, that our government is generally honest uh, and all of those things. And so it is is viewed as a destination. And in fact, they, they've given the term snow washing to, uh, to Canada, right? That, that you know, this uh, um, it's based on our climate, based on the, <laughs> you know, on the view of this sort of this, this, this lily white um, economic and political environment being used to, to launder funds and, uh, and a bit of a blind eye being turned to it. That's very interesting. And I could totally see Trudeau pocketing uh, some fentanyl money. <laughs> a good day for Trudeau. Um, and and it, you mentioned Vancouver. Does, does it happen all over Canada? And what's the reason why it's Vancouver? Is that just proximity? Yeah, that proximity for one. And, and, you know, it's nice to put those funds in a rapidly uh, growing market, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, everything from new condo towers being built, and we are seeing it more in Toronto too, and I think it's going to spread out as, as the opportunity becomes uh, better for the criminals in other markets. Again, you know, this, if you're wiring money in, it doesn't really matter if you're wiring it to, 
to Vancouver or Toronto or Calgary or Saskatoon. Um, right. Vancouver and Toronto have benefit of, of lots of construction, right? So there's lots of product coming on the market, um, easy to buy at different stages, whether it's even at the, at the sort of the pre-build, you know, pre-construction stage, put some money into, into a piece of property. Um, you know, yeah, there is there is proximity and cultural reasons for for some of those things. It's an inflationary market, so that if you want to sell it at some point, right, that integrate those funds, enjoy them, move them somewhere else, um, you're not likely to lose on your investment. I mean, mm. uh, uh, the money laundering stage, I think there's it's accepted that there's going to be a certain you know call it commission or points that are paid for the for the for the privilege of cleaning your funds. But if you can if you can get an upside in the meantime, then that's even better for uh, for anyone, right? So I think that's what's driving it to those to those bigger bigger markets right now in Canada. Interesting. And and what like you know I know as a as a real estate agent we're doing these FinTrack things that cause us a huge headache. Does that actually pre- prevent anything? And what sort of uh, what what's in place right now to prevent these financial crimes? Yeah, yeah FinTrack does require certain businesses. To be what they call reporting entities, they're captured by the legislation, which the it's the Proceeds of Crime, Money Laundering, and Terrorist Financing Act of Canada and its regulations. Right. And on the real estate side of things, brokers and developers are are captured by it. And then the other sort of touch on real estate is the uh, investment dealer side, including exempt market dealers, right? So the private equity kind of investment groups that are taking funds do have to also report to FinTrack and and. FinTrack is first and foremost a financial intelligence unit, right? So it's meant to gather information. Um, I, I think it's it's also looking to um, discourage money laundering, uh, to detect and prevent it in some respects. It's not asking real estate brokers or developers to be law enforcement officers, right? You're not meant to be money laundering investigators, uh, but there are requirements set for those reporting entities to keep records of their customers and transactions, rather in case you know, an investigation is conducted so that that information is available to law enforcement should they come asking for it with a, with a search warrant. Right. Um, and, and to build that database of intelligence that FinTrack uses to support law enforcement efforts in Canada and around the world, right? So things like um, ID requirements, we're now seeing more beneficial ownership requirements necessary. Um, you need to document on a sale, whether it's being done on behalf of a third party, um, you know, so if it's a if it's a lawyer or a friend, or or I'm coming in saying yes, I'm buying this house on behalf of my mom. Um, now in uh, in real estate side, we're seeing more uh, they call politically exposed persons. So they want to document whether the buyer is a a judge, a politician, a senior civil mm. servant, an ambassador, folks that might be exposed to that political corruption as a as a problem. Right. The crime, right? And then there are specific transactions that automatically get submitted to, to FinTrack, large cash transactions, right? So any transaction more than $10,000 in a 24-hour period has to be reported proactively. Uh, suspicious transactions, if something just seems weird, um, right? That that hockey bag full of blood-soaked $20 bills, that's that's suspicious right. to most people. Um, those that's things very, get very yeah, Canadian. Right? Yeah, it gets gets reported directly to uh, directly to FinTrack, so they're aware of it, right? That shows up, but not just not just available if they come asking for it. So, so yeah, those those are meant to um, help them build the intelligence database, build awareness inside reporting entities that are on the front lines of doing these transactions with the potential money launderers and criminals, uh, and uh, and try to discourage that. It's also meant to kind of bolster our street cred internationally with uh, with other agencies that pay attention to these things. Right, so that people don't think it's Vancouver, snow, snow wash, and capital, and yeah, it makes sense. I know uh, for the, for those who might not be aware, FinTrack, as a realtor, for instance, you have to you do a transaction over, I don't know what it is, a million bucks or something like that, and you have to track down the buyer and seller, and you know try and ask them for their corporate documents, driver's license, you know, different tools to make sure that they're legitimate companies. You have to try. You have to try. But I can't can't do everything. So yeah, and document those reasonable efforts. That's that's where they said there's a there's a balance between expecting um, real estate brokers to be a, a law enforcement officer, right, or some sort of gatekeeper, but uh, yeah. and still let your business run in a normal manner. I mean, you don't want um, dirty money flowing to the to the path of least resistance, right? You want to have a sort of a minimal level of compliance across the industry. That's that's uh, not going to discourage people from from doing legitimate business one place because of the. The, the the friction, right? Can, sorry, go ahead. So, so yeah, Greg. Given the fact that Canada is obviously you know 
got their own colloquial term of, of snow washing. W what are other countries doing that are that's different than us that I would assume to be more effective? Ah. Yeah, I, you know. Washing or <laughs> what, what, else, what else could it be? Yeah, it's a good, like, we're, we're um, part of what's you know, it's called the, the Financial Action Task Force, the FATF, and it's an intergovernmental group started by the G7 countries. There's other members meant to be kind of this collaborative quasi-United Nations approach to, to financial crime. And, and there is a regular, every few years, sort of a review of each country's compliance regime by the, the FATF just to see how we're doing. Some of the things they pointed to Canada as being weak, uh, weak on is um, our corporate transparency and beneficial ownership. And those rules are starting to change, but they're changing at a provincial level, not a national level. So the obligation to, to disclose who owns more than 10% of a given company. BC's brought that in, uh, but uh, it's not national across the country. Lawyers are exempt from FinTrack here. Um, most hmm. other countries, they are obliged to, to follow the same rules that a, that a broker would have to do. Um, the solicitor client privilege is a pretty uh, enshrined right in this country and, and in a lot of places, but this is that's one area where they have decided that that FinTrack doesn't need to be. Uh, there's some debate about that. And and generally the other sort of black mark against us in Canada is our limited enforcement and punishment, right? That, that um, the, uh, the RCMP is Canada's national police force is not always um, adequately funded to address uh, to address money laundering. Uh, so we're not seeing a lot of investigations, we're seeing fewer prosecutions, and then we're seeing even fewer convictions. And when they are, it's it's minimal sort of punishment and, and sentencing compared to a jurisdiction like the U.S. Uh, where you'd see more money laundering charges on a regular basis and people actually going to jail for it. What would the like typical charge be in terms of like if they were to get convicted here? Of an like, a, like a sentence? Yeah. You know, there's, there's honestly just there's so few actual convictions of it. It's often one of the bargaining chips, right? Where we're in my experience, and and I've been out of the criminal justice system for a little while. Uh, in my experience, the prosecutors would look to convict on the underlying uh, the underlying offense, the drug trafficking, uh, and would plea out the money laundering charge as uh, you know as a way to kind of get a deal to move things through court. And there's there's perfectly valid reasons to want to move things through court and save lengthy expensive prosecution so i'm not going to necessarily second guess some of that but but typically it's a it's a disgorgement of profits it's a forfeiture of assets which is a nice way you want to take away that profit motive uh, from criminals and makes them harder for them to get back into the business if their seed capital gets forfeited to the government right um, you know or or there may be a concurrent sentence that's laid on it right so you're going to get five years for drug trafficking and you're going to get one year for money laundering, but you're going to serve it at the same time as the five years for drug trafficking. So, you know, the actual days in jail doesn't uh, doesn't go up. That's a pretty sweet deal. Yeah. Um, so, Greg, so you were uh, from 1996 to 2006, a, a financial crimes investigator with the RCMP. Yep. Um, can you take us through, you know, one of your invest? Did, did you ever investigate anybody in, in the real estate sector? And, you know, how did that come from the from the moment where you kind of i don't know saw 10 ferraris in somebody's parking lot and said well that doesn't seem right to actually catching them yeah so you know commercial real estate is is, is pretty specific on that side i mean i a, a chunk of my time i did spend in calgary uh, on uh, what was then called the integrated proceeds of crime unit right so it was the money laundering and asset forfeiture uh, side of things, and so you know, we would would, and, and typically, drug trafficking was our was a was the underlying offense that we investigated for the most part for for a bunch of reasons. Um, you know, yeah, it's it's a combination of either some sort of intelligence indicating that an individual is involved in drug trafficking. Uh, we would do a financial workup on them to understand what assets they may have. Um, you know, it's access of it, it could be something as simple as as um, you know real estate records and transaction records um, it's sometimes you can access the tax records open source intelligence and information surveillance to track them to a given property and understand who owns that uh, their properties of them or a family member um, and then you move into uh, investigating both the underlying crime and the financial aspect of it right so like if you you think about it uh, 
you're you selling drugs, right? You, 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 you buy drugs, you sell them, and you, get, you generate cash. You use that cash to buy more drugs, right? It's like any, yeah. other, any right. other retail business in that sense, right? But from a law enforcement perspective, if you're focusing on strictly on the drug aspect, then you've got a very small window of time when the bad guy has the drugs in their hand that you want to arrest them. If you if you add a proceeds of crime and money laundering component, now the entire cycle is open to your investigation and it gives you a better sense of uh, of, of where they're at. So, you know, if, um, you know, for example, if a kilo of cocaine is going for 40,000 bucks and you arrest the guy with a single kilo of cocaine, his lawyer is going to say, yeah, well, it's just one kilo. This guy's not Pablo Escobar and and, uh, you know, they're going to they're going to be for a minimal sentence. But if you seize four million dollars of cash, you say, "Hey, wait a minute, right? That's you know, that's a hundred kilos of cocaine in in, right. in in profits, right? So you can point to sort of the size of the criminal operation from from there. So so it is identifying what real estate they have. Um, it's doing forensic accounting work to determine whether they have legitimate sources of income to pay for it. Um, it's getting an understanding of the size of the drug operation and then sort of translating that into the profit that would be generated by it. And then ideally, come come takedown day or arrest day, when you when you go and arrest the bad guy, you're seizing his house. Um, you know, I, I've uh, I've seized houses in in um, in Canada in Vancouver. I seized a house overlooking a golf course in uh, Barbados, which was uh, kind of a sweet little oh, wow. uh, quite little little treat. Uh, we've taken away high end cars, uh, bank accounts, jewelry. Oh my God! Uh, you know, the whole the whole range, right? And uh, so it is kind of nice to take that uh, with the the trophies and their their badges of success away uh, away from the from uh, from that sense, right? So right. you're like the uh, the investigator in the Wolf of Wall Street when he goes and chats with the guy on his yacht. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is there is a bit of cat and mouse to it, which. Um, yeah, there's 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 pros and cons to that approach, but uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, Garrett, yeah, I know we have a few more questions here. Um, I don't know. I'm still just taken aback by by all this information. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think about uh, basically my my in depth experience comes from a combination of watching the Ozarks, um, Breaking Bad, and The Untouchables. Uh, the movie right. so just mashing all of those things together um which in turn you know they've obviously had some experience when they wrote those shows and movies <laughs> yeah you know th and those are yeah they're all based in truth so to speak right you know it's uh you know the the, the methodologies i mean the yeah ozark is a good example right of that it's like that strip mall that i talked about earlier right where it's just kind of a cash-based business and and Maybe there's some legitimate operations, and you're just boosting the the revenues with the legal money, or maybe you know the entire source of, of reported revenues is illegal money. Uh, you get through that. There's there's crooked um, intermediaries, right? Lawyers and accountants, the you know the the Saul Goodmans yeah, of the right. world, so to speak, right? And uh, you know it's it's there's there's not a lot of them, but there are some, right? There's um, you know I've had the opportunity to see that from a from a law enforcement side, and I've done some work for the the law societies when they're investigating uh, their own members, and, and one particular one, a large Ponzi scheme where, uh, like a multi million dollar international Ponzi scheme where funds were flowing through a lawyer's trust account, and the and the, the law society asked me to help them uh, because of my experience with investment fraud and money laundering, to uh, you know more so than they would normally see from a lawyer who did a lousy job filling out a you know a, 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 a residential real estate contract for a client, right? So. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I know I have the worst questions to ask because all I'm thinking is, well, where would one find one of these crooked lawyers? <laughs> <laughs> but you don't, you don't have to answer that. So what? So what? Um, I guess a couple questions. Maybe we can end this on a on a positive, not uh, crimey kind of note. But like, if you are trying to avoid getting caught for some of this what is the best pro tip don't don't be greedy i guess is the is the thing right i think you've got to be you got to be um uh, yeah to avoid getting caught you've got to be consistent you've got to be thorough you've got to be disciplined uh you got to be prepared to to pay for the privilege of not getting caught in some respects so i i think right. the more complex time consuming and expensive a money laundering scheme would be the the harder it's going to be to disrupt for law enforcement. So, interesting. And and okay, uh, Greg, what what is it? So now 
at MNP, the bodyguard of, of ethics and uh, really on the other side of things. I mean, actually, yeah. you, were, you were always on that side of things. Uh, kind of what advice would you give to, I don't know, people in the real estate business? I think, you know, a lot of this is, is I know it can be tempting, particularly in tough economic times. You don't want to turn away a sale, right? But a, but a reputation of a business like an individual, it takes a lifetime to build and a moment to destroy, right? And so as soon as you're on the front page of the paper as having allowed this to come through your business, even if you took reasonable measures, uh, the reputation of your business is going to be tarnished. There will be those that choose not to do business with you because of that, especially the whole, you know, environmental, social and governance movement that's coming and, and uh, the focus on on corporate ethics is getting bigger than it ever has been in the past. Uh, you may have a hard time attracting capital if you're looking to, to invest and grow, where more and more of these organizations will be doing their due diligence and they'll find out that, you know, that your, your client base, your risk assessment, your approach to uh, anti-money laundering compliance and, and whether it's a you know, sort of a bare minimum, you know, compliance or whether it's more actually focused on on promoting an ethical workplace. So, um, you know, yeah, I, I think that is the, that is the thing you have to think about, not just what you can get away with, but, uh, you know, what's right in your business and, uh, you know, the, the message that you want to send to to your employees, uh, to your customers and to your investors. Wow. OK. Well, I think that's I think that's a great note. Yeah. And and again, we strongly recommend that you do not do any financial crimes or any crimes of that nature. You heard it here first on this podcast. Yeah. Um, do you have Do you have any other questions, Garrett? No, I'm good. Okay, we this is this is amazing because the whole time it's exciting, so we we like to keep it <laughs> keep it tight. But uh, Greg, thank you so so much, and uh, you can't maybe you might not be able to see Megan, but Megan, thank you as well. Uh, we appreciate you guys being on the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Great. Thanks. For, good to speak with you guys. Thanks, Greg.